I'd like to begin this morning by having us do something a little different, which is leading you in a prayer exercise that is called Visio Divina, or Divine or Holy Seeing. It's based on another, older form of prayer that you may have heard of called Lectio Divina, which is Divine Reading. And Lectio Divina is a way of praying the Scriptures, but whereas Lectio Divina draws us deeper into written texts, Visio Divina draws us deeper into works of art. And it's a way of reflecting on what the artist has rendered, a way of seeing deeper, of allowing the Holy Spirit to guide our eyes and our thoughts. And so we're going to be doing that this morning, uh, using this image that is inside your worship bulletin. A painting by Emily Carr entitled, Scorned as Timber, Beloved of Sky. So if you'll get that ready, and while you're getting it ready, uh, I'm going to walk you through what we're going to do before we do it. All right, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, but only do that if you know you're going to open them again. All right, so get yourself in a comfortable posture, and you're going to want to hold this image in a way, you can hold it out in front of you, you can hold it down, whatever's comfortable, but you want to hold it in a way that it's going to be the first thing you see when you open your eyes. I'm going to have you breathe, get yourself centered, and then when you first open your eyes, I'm going to ask you to latch on to the very first detail of this image that your eyes catch. Don't look at all of it, just look at that one thing and hold it in your mind. And then after you've held it for a while, I'm going to ask you to zoom out and take a look at the entire image. And then to ask yourself some questions. What was it about that first thing that grabbed my attention? What about that detail speaks to me or intrigues me or puzzles me? How does that detail relate to the rest of the image as a whole? And what's really going on in this painting? What emotions does the image stir in me? And why may that be? And does this image perhaps lead me into an attitude of prayer? And we'll spend a few moments considering those questions, and then we'll end with a time of giving thanks to God for what God has revealed to us through the Holy Spirit, and there's space on the back if you want to write down your reflections a little bit later. All right, so let's give this a try. All right, position the painting so that when you close your eyes, it'll be the first thing you see when you open them, and then go ahead and close your eyes. Take a deep breath in, then a deep breath out. And then when you're ready, open your eyes and let your eyes stay with the very first detail that you see in the painting. Keep your attention there on that one particular part of the image. And try to keep your eyes from wandering to the rest of the picture. Again, breathe in deeply and let your gaze at that part of the image linger. You might even wish to close your eyes again and hold that detail in your mind's eye. But just breathe and hold that detail. Now, zoom out. Let your eyes consider the whole painting. Take your time and really look. Really look at this painting. Let your eyes wander all over it. Look at the details in the background, in the foreground, at the top and the bottom. Really take a moment to truly look and see what is there.
the colors, the textures. And now, consider the following questions. What was the thing that first caught my eye and grabbed my attention? What is it about that detail that speaks to me or intrigues me or puzzles me? The second question, how does that detail relate to the rest of the image? What's going on in this painting? Thirdly, what emotions does this painting stir in me? Does it make me happy or sad? Fill me with wonder, curiosity? What emotions does this image stir in me and why? What about the painting makes me feel that way? And finally, does this painting stir any prayers within you? And if so, offer those prayers to God. And then finally, Speak a word of thanksgiving to God for what the Holy Spirit has revealed, for what this painting has stirred in you, and how you may have connected to God in the world through this form of prayer. And with that, we say, Amen. So, uh, take this with you, um, and uh, write reflections on the back after the service. And uh, you may even want to, to do the exercise again. But I wanted to share this with you. Some of you have done this um, with me before. But I wanted to uh, share this exercise with you this morning for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, you've had Emily Carr's art in front of you all throughout Advent uh, in the weekly devotionals that my wife Kristen uh, put together for us all to use to center our reflections during our time of preparation for Christmas. And I wanted to introduce you to a way of incorporating art into your prayers after Advent. Uh, and you can really use Visio Divina with, with any, any form of art. But the second reason is, I think this exercise of Visio Divina is a very appropriate way for us to enter into our Scripture lessons for today on New Year's Eve, because New Year's Eve is a natural time for reflection. It is quite possibly the most familiar and easily recognizable liminal space that we encounter as residents of our modern world. The sun is setting on the year that has been, and we are awaiting the dawn of the year that is to come, often with a glass of champagne in one hand and a pair of goofy glasses on our face. But however we choose to celebrate or not celebrate, we often take time even if just for a couple of seconds, we take time to look back. And the media often helps us to do this by their retrospectives that they prepare and their in-memoriam pieces that they, that they put out. We look back on what has been, we take stock of where we are, and we project forward our hopes and aspirations onto the coming year hopes that life will be better or different for us. Even if this present year has been good to us, we still hope and aspire to more in the year that is to come. Perhaps we think about making a change that we've wanted to make for a while. All of this, this New Year's time, all of this comes natural. I would also argue that it's important work for us 
not just as individuals and as a society, but it's important work for us as a church. Because we often can't see or see fully how and where God has been at work in our lives and in the world, except through this process of reflection, of looking back, even though our God is a God of the present and the future and not the past, because of the human <laughs> limitations that we all possess, sometimes it's only in the past that we can recognize how God was active in the present. Because in the words of the prophet Isaiah, God is a God who does new things. In the words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our God is a God of the living and not the dead. But how God has acted in the past, what God has promised in the past, is very much the source of our hope in the present and going forward into the future. And this is the dynamic that we saw at work as we were preparing for the Christmas story and as we were hearing the Christmas story last week, we see in the pages of Scripture God's people looking back, looking back to God's promises to David and to the nation of Israel and to Abraham, of taking stock of God's challenge to God's people through the words of the prophets as well as God's words of encouragement and reassurance through the prophets. The words of the prophet Isaiah again, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We cannot fully understand what has taken place in Bethlehem apart from the context of these words of prophecy, this long history of God's journey with God's people. So the Christmas story invites us to look backward, but the Christmas story also prompts us to look forward, because Christmas is not just the story of who this child Jesus is, but the proclamation of who He will become. And the archangel Gabriel makes the first projection into the future about Jesus when he first visits Mary to tell her what is about to take place. And of this child that she is to bear, he says, he will be, he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And now today, in the latter part of Luke chapter 2, we receive the second projection into the future, courtesy of an old and faithful man named Simeon, whom the Holy Family encounters in the temple when they present the infant Jesus there, eight days following his birth, according to their tradition. Luke tells us that the Holy Spirit had revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the promised Messiah. And when he sees Mary and Joseph bring Jesus into the temple, he is overcome, and he takes the baby Jesus in his arms, and he rejoices, and he says, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. But then he says to Mary something else. This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your heart also. Looking back, looking forward, this is how we understand who the Christ child is and who he is to become, not only for us, but for the whole world. 
But there's more. There's more than just looking forward and looking back. As hearers of the gospel, as followers and disciples of this Jesus, there is another dimension that we must also engage in our reflections to truly understand what God has done, is doing, and will do. And that's the act of looking deeper. Not just seeing what there is to see, but seeing beneath the surface of what meets our eyes. Because so very often, that is where God is truly present. That is where God is at work. And we can be actively searching and seeking God, but if we're not looking deep enough, we're likely to miss Him. Just as if we were to go searching for the King of Kings and the Prince of Peace among the aristocracy of the world, we'd be looking for a long time because that's not where Jesus resides, despite His regal titles. Our God moves mysteriously and moves deeply in our world. Facility with this extra dimension of looking deeper beneath the service is what an exercise like Visio Divina is intended to help us develop, to help us to learn to see how an artist like Emily Carr is able to see. Because in the mid-1930s, anyone passing by this particular patch of forest in British Columbia could have seen this tree standing there alone amidst this patch of stumps left by the loggers for whatever reason. Some might have even paused to wonder about the tree. Wow, would you look at that? They left that tree standing there. But very few others would have been able to see the wonder in the tree that Emily Carr sees and has painted for us on this canvas. Very few others would have seen the glory in the sky above the tree, would have seen God's love for this tree that was forsaken by men. That glory is what Emily Carr saw, not just because she went looking for it, but because she practiced looking for it in the spiritual rhythms of her life. And she was also willing to wait to see it, wait for God to reveal to her what lay beneath the surface. She waited for it. And this patience is key because there's a big difference between seeing what's truly there and seeing what we want to see. And we can easily confuse the two. But this extra quality of sight, this is something that an artist like Emily Carr shares with biblical figures like Simeon and the prophetess Anna in Luke 2. Because just like with this tree in the British Columbia forest. There would have been a lot of people in the temple that day when Mary and Joseph brought the infant Jesus to present Him to the Lord. Lots of people would have seen this young couple offering sacrifices with and for their baby son. Some might have even caught their eye, or Mary and Joseph might have even caught some people's eyes they may have been doing something in a particular way or struck them as being particularly pious in some way. But of all those people, of all those people gathered there on that day, only Simeon and Anna were able to see Jesus in his true, full reality. And yes, that was accomplished through the working of God in their lives, but it was also accomplished through their willingness to work with God in their lives, their willingness to be patient and to wait for the Holy Spirit to reveal what lies beneath the surface, and then the courage, the faithfulness to proclaim it to others, to hold up what God has revealed to them so that others might also catch a glimpse. I think it's important for us to note 
that Anna's response to seeing the baby Jesus here in the latter part of Luke 2 is the same as the shepherd's response on the night that he was born. Luke tells us of the shepherds, when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And then of Anna, Luke tells us, at that moment, she came to the temple and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Our continued spiritual engagement, our continued spiritual growth not only involves training our eyes to see God's presence in unexpected places, like mangers on the edge of the Roman Empire, like forsaken trees passed over by loggers in the forest, but also by training our ears to hear God's voice in unexpected mouths, to listen to and accept the testimony of artists like Emily, of men like the shepherds, of women like Anna, who have seen have seen truly remarkable things. People who aren't the usual suspects, who aren't the sanctioned mouthpieces of our culture and our institutions. Because a great part of the good news of Christmas isn't just that our God has become flesh in Christ, but that in Christ we, all of us, have become children of God in Christ, all of us. And more than that, not just children of God, but co-heirs with Christ to the very kingdom of heaven. Learning to see, learning to see God, learning to see Christ, not just in the out-of-the-way places of the world, but also in the out-of-the-way people of the world. That's how we truly catch a glimpse of God's glory and the glory of God's work in this world. Because God is still very much a God who does new things. God is still very much present with us. God is still very much working to transform and redeem us and all of creation. Learning to see learning to hear. That's how we catch the true glory of Christmas. And that's how we will continue to catch it in this new year that will be. And so as we say goodbye to 2017 and say hello to 2018, it is my prayer that God will grant us eyes to see and ears to hear and that we might continue to go with each other and with God faithfully to see all that Christ has come to reveal to us. Thanks be to God for this most truly wondrous gift. Amen.